For the Clarity Crew, I'm Kurt Gebhardt, and all week long on Anchored, we have been celebrating the glory and power of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. The resurrection is a founding feature of Christianity. If it's true, it changes everything. And if it's false, then we are fools beyond other things. And so Paul's testimony in 1 Corinthians 15 about this is very, very powerful. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 says, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We're even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Jesus from the dead, whom he did not raise if there is indeed no resurrection. The resurrection is absolutely essential to our faith, and understanding it and knowing the proofs are very, very important to our faith being established and secure. J.I. Packer says that the victim of Calvary, the one who died on the cross, is now loose and at large, and King Jesus is. He is the one who is reigning on the throne because he has risen forevermore. Nickel, one theologian, says the empty tomb of Christ is the cradle of the church. It's where the church began. It's where the church was established and where the church was founded. And B.F. Westcott says this, taking all the evidence together, it is not too much to say that there is no other single historical incident better or more variously supported than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is true, he is risen from the dead, and it is the foundation of our faith and the most central message of our faith that authenticates the person of Jesus Christ. So let me give you the first nine proofs that we covered on Tuesday very briefly, and then we'll get into 10 through 30. Number one, no body. Number two, no bones. Number three, centrality of the message for the Christian cause. Number four, the prominence of the resurrection message in early apostolic preaching. Number five, the birthplace of Christianity so soon and on the site of the resurrection is a proof. Number six, cowards to preachers. Number seven, the transformation of Peter. Number eight, that the apostles died martyrs' death for what would be a lie? Implausible. Number nine, the salvation and change within Paul is what we studied on Tuesday. Now to number 10. Jesus predicted his death and burial four times in the Gospel of Matthew 16, Matthew 17, Matthew 20, Matthew 26. He predicts his arrest, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Jesus was preparing his people in the final weeks and months of his ministry for this inevitability and is one of the proofs. Number 11, how could it all have happened? How could a cowardly, scared, disorganized band of disciples between Friday, Saturday, then Sunday, somehow find a way in the middle of the night, early Sunday morning somehow, getting to the, the place where he was buried and oh, subduing the Roman guard, rolling this massive one-ton stone uphill to open the grave and to commit a hoax. It just seems completely illogical. Number 12, the cover-up would have involved too many people. If you think about this scenario, how many people would it have involved? And they all would have kept silent? Seems impossible. The grave clothes also are another testimony because it says in the Gospel of John that basically his what he would have been wrapped in basically fell when his body was removed miraculously, but that the piece that would, would have been over his head was then folded there on the bed. And the point is this, the angel... Uh, was very meticulous to leave these signs behind. But would a group of men that were committing a hoax and lying and tricking and stealing a body, would they have taken the time to have been that diligent? It's, again, impossible to think that they would have. Number 14, um, there was so much care taken by the adversaries. In Matthew 27, 62 through 66, it talks about how the Pharisees, knowing that he had predicted that he was raised from the dead, he called the Romans to guard the tomb. And so they even know, knew that he had predicted this and prophesied about it. And they were very careful to make sure that it didn't happen. And yet God overwhelmed them through the angels and an earthquake. Number 15, the Roman guards going AWOL again would have been impossible unless there was some cover-up because them losing charge of their captor, their captive, excuse me, uh, which is Jesus, who was in the dead, it was a pretty easy gig, by the way, just standing there and standing guard over a dead body, but them losing their captive, but also them abandoning their post would have meant their life would have been taken. But again, they were protected by the lies and the cover-up of the Pharisees. 
um, going against the truth of the supernatural power of God. Number 16, the risk of breaking the imperial seal would have led to, again, the life of those that had been so bold to do that. But again, God did it, and God overwhelmed even the Roman authorities. Number 17, the eyewitness accounts on, of Resurrection Day, Mary and Mary and Peter and John and the, the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then the 12 apostles, or really, sorry, it would have been the 10, because Thomas was not there, nor was Judas there, but 10 apostles. Jesus appeared to all of them on that very day. The number of total people who experienced the resurrection, it's a massive number. In fact, you'll remember when we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, that it says that 500 people witnessed Jesus at one time in Galilee when he was ministering after his resurrection, before his ascension. Absolutely incredible, the number of people that it would have represented. Number 19, the number and diversity of appearances and diversity in locations from Jerusalem to Galilee with the apostles multiple times. He appeared to the 10 apostles on the, his resurrection day. And then seven days later, the very next Sunday, he appeared to those same apostles and Thomas, where he called Thomas to press into the holes in his hands and to help and undergird Thomas's doubt. Number 20, the change in James, the half-brother of Jesus. He was a doubter. He did not follow Jesus, was not one of Jesus' disciples, but then became a pillar and the leader of the Jerusalem church. How did that happen? Well, something miraculous needed to have occurred, like a resurrection. Number 21, the character and consistent testimony of the apostles. These weren't rogues. These were men of character. They were simple men and fishermen, but they were men that had a testimony of honor in faithfully following Jesus. Number 22, the women. The preponderance of women as eyewitnesses in this account give, underscore the credibility of the account. You see, women in that day would not have had the, uh, um, the ability legally to testify in court. And if this whole story were doctored or, or created after the fact, women would not have been put in position, um, prime position, to be the um, most, in, uh, most common and first witness bearers of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It would have been written a different way if the story was made up. It isn't made up, and it's written as it happened because of the power of God. Again, the plain and straightforward accounts is number 23. It's very simply stated, when you read the resurrection accounts, there's nothing flirted about them. They just simply state what happened because it's true and factual. Number 24, Jesus' disappearance after 40 days is a powerful testimony as well. Uh, he rose from the grave miraculously, and after 40 days of his time here in his resurrection ministry, he ascended to heaven. And that's recorded in Acts 1, 6 through 9. So he was miraculously raised from the dead and miraculously ascended to heaven. And that's why, again, there's no body to be found because he is in heaven reigning forevermore. Number 25, the immediate universality of the resurrection is spread like wildfire in the early church. Number 26, the move from Sabbath worship, worship on the seventh day of the week, to worship on Sunday, the first day of the week, happened because it was a commemoration of Jesus' resurrection on the first day of the week. Number 27, the transformation of pagan baptism into a Christian symbol. Uh, the early baptisms that were undergone by believers was taken from a, a pagan symbol and turned into an extraordinary image of dying and raising from the dead. Why was that a Christian symbol? It became a Christian symbol because of Jesus' resurrection and were resurrected, Romans 6, to the newness of life. Number 28, the early creedal testimony, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7, dates within a few years of the resurrection and was a testimony to their belief in the resurrection from the earliest days of the church. Number 29, the impossibility of a later story explanation. If Jesus were buried and the apostles made it up years later, Jesus' tomb would have been identified and known by many in Jerusalem and established as a shrine already. It had to have happened immediately or it wouldn't have happened at all. Number 30, the number and power of the enemies of the cross. The Romans and the Jewish leaders, they conspired to kill him and would have done anything to discredit this amazing tale, but they couldn't because it was the power of God and of Jesus himself that raised him from the dead to overcome all of these other earthly powers. The Lord Jesus reigns on high, reigns supreme forevermore. And so... We have this poem called A Solitary Life. He was born in an obscure village 
a child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village where he worked as a, in a carpenter shop until he was about 30. For three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never traveled 200 miles away from where he was born. He did nothing, none of the things that are usually associated with greatness. He was only in his mid-30s when the tide of public opinion turned against him. He was turned over to the enemies and then through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves and he was dead. He was laid in a borrowed grave. 19th centuries have come and gone and today he is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched and all the navies that have ever sailed and all the kings that have ever reigned have not affected the life of humankind as much as this one solitary life. And why has it changed the world the way that it has? Is because he died and he rose again on the third day and reigns forevermore. Worship the resurrected Jesus and be established in your faith by these 30 proofs of the resurrection. For the Clarity Crew, I'm Kurt Kepards. Be encouraged, be challenged, be clear.